my bills, take care of my family, and have a good life. And in order to do that, I have to have a nice work-life balance. I have to go on vacations. I gotta have fun. I gotta go to concerts. I gotta see live live performance because it refills my cup. It inspires me when I go see other people perform and see them happy and in their element. You know, there's a time where you were so used to being told no that when people mm. start saying yes, you don't know when to turn them away. You don't know when to turn you know, someone offers, if it was an offer, I'm like, sure, we'll do it. And then it led to me having some bad times and some bad experiences. I'm a big believer in mantras and, and different things. And there was this one time I just made a mantra where I was just like, you know what I really want is less work, more money. <laughs> and that's easy to say and fun to say, but it's terrifying in reality sometimes to turn down something. And just go, I feel like something better is going to happen. And my acting coach from day one, she was just like, there's like five or six reasons why you take a job. You're like, money. Do you need that money? If you need it, take that job. Is it going to be a good experience for you? Is it going to be an experience where it's going to bring you around people? Maybe it's not going to give you the money. Maybe it's not going to be that fun. But is it going to bring you around great people? Is it going to bring you around the people that you want to be around? You know, and if, it, if those the things are true, then take the job. But if they're not true, don't take the job. And I've seen so many of my friends who are more successful than me. And, I'm, and like, they never take a vacation. They never um, seem that happy. <laughs> they seem very frustrated. And I was just like, I don't ever want, like, when do you win? You know? When do you realize that you have a beautiful life and you have fun? And so i rather, you know, make a little less money and go to Japan for a couple of weeks or just do what I need to to have a fun and beautiful life because that's what I'm here for. I'm not here to, um, you know, produce content for other people. I'm here to have a fun life. It's my and Bialik's breakdown. She's going to break it down for you because you know she knows a thing or two. And now she's going to break down. It's a breakdown. She's going to break it down. Hi, I'm Ryan Bialik. I'm Jonathan Cohen. And welcome to our breakdown. This is the place where we break things down so you don't have to. Today we're breaking down someone who broke me down on his show. Trades. <laughs> uh, Ron Funches. How do we know Ron? You know him. Even if you don't know his name, you know him. He's a, a wonderful stand-up comedian. Um, he also has a podcast that I've been on called Getting Better with Ron Funches. He's he's on the Maya Rudolph show, Loot, on Apple, on TV. Apple TV. He's super funny. He's and, been the voice of so many characters. And we have a really, really good time talking to him. He has sons 20 years apart. Also, on his Instagram page, he's got a clip of his stand-up where he describes his voice as a Disney bear that teaches you responsibility. <laughs> he's amazing. Also, we make him laugh, and he has probably one of the best laughs of anyone we've ever uh, had the pleasure of making laugh. Welcome to The Breakdown, Ron Funches. Break it down. Thank you for having me, of course. Thank you for letting me in your home. <laughs> I did your podcast mm -hmm. like two years ago, I think. I think so. I think three years ago. I was talking about Call Me Cat at the time. And I think I was, our podcast was new. So I appreciated you allowing me to come on and talk about our podcast. Come on. And um, we're excited to have you here. I have many questions about many things. Okay. Jonathan, is there somewhere you would like to start? I just want to know what's up, man. How, how you doing? Thank you. That's good. <laughs> good combo. <laughs> she comes with a yeah, list. I come with cop, like... Good cop. <laughs> I <re> <laughs> This is a good interrogation. Uh, I'm, I'm doing well. I'm been uh, starting a new uh, like training program where I'm eating some fun stuff and cooking more for myself. So that's made me feel good. I made a nice grilled salmon before I got here, and so that was I was like, this is a fun afternoon to <laughs> sit down on the patio and just eat it after I made it, and it just made me feel like a real man. And then just been hanging out with my sons. I've um, been doing a little bit of touring but i've been trying to cut back a bit i mean in general they wouldn't ask what you said how um in general uh for sleepy um 
<laughs> happy, somewhat stressed out, uh, and just trying to um, make it through the strike and get back to work hopefully soon. Absolutely. Firstly, cooking salmon always increases the value of the day. You know, <laughs> it makes you feel good, like you mm -hmm. accomplished something. So I, I understand that. But what's what's stressing you out? Um, oh, okay. This is I thought about this before I got here, so it's funny. He said he didn't have a list. But yeah, he's got he, a list. yeah. He, oh, I mean, it's how you uh, play the game. <laughs> he, no, no, true good cop. He said it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, it, I thought about this recently, and so it made me both, like, h happy in part of it, because it was like, oh, my life's really changed. The number one thing stressing me out right now is I'm in the middle of a divorce, and I'd love that mm -hmm. to just wrap up so I know what my life is going to be like, and just so I can feel like I'm not stuck in an old pattern and that I'm moving forward. That would make me feel so much better. Um, the second thing that is stressing me out in my life right now is that um, the bidet in my toilet stops functioning <laughs> properly. And so it doesn't do the self-cleaning function, nor does it pulsate against my butt currently. And it is and I'm like, that's what I bought it for. So it's really stressing me out. And my assistant is on a vacation. So I have to be the one to take care of it. So it's got to wait till she gets back. And <laughs> <laughs> And so it's stressing me out a bit because I was like, this is why I bought this. And then, but I was like, oh, what a beautiful thing that that is my second biggest stressor. Um, <laughs> my third is just constantly my, like, just trying to take care of my diet and, and um, my health, make sure, because I got two sons 20 years apart. And, wow. um, you know, used to be 360 and then down a lot and then up a little. And whenever I go up a little, it stresses me out because I feel like I'm going to go back to where I was. So it's like sandwich of like real stressors, but in the middle, just like, okay, beautiful life. Well, it is annoying when things don't do what they're supposed to do. Especially mm -hmm. I'll, I'll, a bidet. So I just want to acknowledge that. Thank you. I appreciate that. It could be a wife. It could be a bidet. <laughs> Nobody's doing what they're supposed to do in Ron's life. Yeah, I could do. Well, there's many dirty jokes I could make <laughs> currently. Um, but I will just not pick the low-hanging fruit. But let you think of it. <laughs> um. Well, the first thing I was thinking when you mentioned your first stressor, and you're in good company. We're both divorced people. Mm -hmm. um, so you're in safe company. A lot of people before everyone was getting divorced, when they heard that I was divorced, I was one of the first people that I knew, you know, in my circle you that were was trend divorced. Setter. I was I was a trendsetter. Trailblazer in ways. And, First the flower hat, and, then the divorce. Yeah. And you know, I <laughs> I I everybody having fun? Well, I cannot let a good that's a solid burn. <laughs> <laughs> what I was going to say is I, I come from a family where, like, you don't get divorced. You just, like, suffer in silence mm -hmm. until someone dies. Like, that's the thing. So <laughs> That's how you know for, it's true love. That's, that's how you know it's true love. Um, but for me, I felt like a lot of shame. I felt a lot of shame about it. And I didn't know other people getting divorced. And then little did I know, you know, the 2000s were going to hit hard and heavy. And then a lot of people started getting divorced. So I felt Some less of them alone. Unconsciously coupling. <laughs> Some were <laughs> unconsciously coupling. But um I just I guess you also you got married during COVID. Mm -hmm. Adorable pictures, I have to say. Thank I hope it's you. not a sore spot to bring no, up. The pictures were a great. masked wedding is yeah. where you you really rocked it out. Thank you. Um and you have you have a tiny one. Mm -hmm. Like he's one, is that right? He's 16 months. He's yeah. 16 months. Oh. oh my gosh, that's awesome. Um, do you talk about sort of the evolution of where you're at with it? You don't have to. You talk about it just like in the life? divorce. No, like with yeah, like what it's like doing that with a little one, especially like mine were four and seven, and it seemed like it, it's an added complexity. Yeah. So I'm curious what that's like parenting this time around while also dealing, you know, with a larger stressor. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's a mix of things. As you know, I've always been. When my mom asked me about it, and I tried to be honest, and I was like, she was like, well, would you have had a kid knowing that you would have gotten divorced so quickly? And I was like, it's hard to say. <laughs> like, you know, I certainly wouldn't have been like, you know, let's have this kid and then just not be together. Right. This seems wild. Um, and, and being a single, I mean, I was a single 
parent for many years already. I have um, sole custody of my oldest son for many years. And so I kind of thought that this was going to be kind of the, you know, inverse of that, where Mm. I was going to have this traditional family and come home from work and just shoot shows or do whatever I do, go on the road and come home and have this family dynamic. And then when I realized that it didn't, that the, you know, ideal of it and the, the, premise of it was better than the execution Mm. it was a hard decision to make but it was also more having my son was like a like a big trigger for to be kind of like well how do I want to raise him to be? What type of man do I want him to be? Do I, would I want him to stay in something that's not working for him? Would I want him to um, compromise what he feels and truly believes in himself or is this in, to not follow his instincts? And mm-hmm. I want, and I would say, no, you know, I always want to instill in my sons to believe in themselves and to follow what they believe in, even if it's a hard decision, even if other people tell you it's the wrong decision to believe in yourself. And I, you know, in order to say that, you got to kind of live that, you know? Mm -hmm. So um, that was a pusher into that. And now I'm just kind of look at the blessings of whatever I have, like, you know, having sole custody of my oldest son, it's been a lot of fully soul and to have uh, someone that I can co-parent with that someone that does take great care of my son and our, our son and does take um love and 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 just you know we not we don't work together but they seem to work Got very it. well together so I'm happy for that what's it like having kids a generation apart essentially oh it's awesome what is your older son like what's his take on on being a, a a brother at an age when some people have kids. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I had my first son when I was 20. Ooh. So to now have my other son and then to see my oldest <laughs> 20 being like, wow, you you have such a baby face. <laughs> <laughs> no one should give you a child at all. I left him in a hotel room alone the other day and I said, don't open the door for anyone. And he turned to his Spider-Man doll and said, don't don't open the door, Spider Man. I'm like, you're. Tw- that's the age I was. <laughs> so now <laughs> it's nice to have more resources and to um, be able to, you know, I just try to make sure I utilize them and not try to feel shame about it, having mm-hmm. a nanny or whatever, and just. Um, I still feel older, so I feel tired. I yeah. definitely had much more energy when I was 20 and doing it. But now, you know, I think, and also my oldest son is, you know, on the autism spectrum. And I have, you know, my too young, early to tell for sure. I'm sure he'll have his own uh, character sheet to live by. <laughs> but my youngest so far seems to be pretty neurotypical. And so that's a real difference for me to to have a kid that's very social Mm. and likes to talk to other people. And I mean, I remember when I was like, realized I was like, Oh no, we're going to have sleepovers. Mm. I can tell already. We're going to have a bunch of sleepovers. And I never had to deal with that with my oldest son. So that's going to be uh, something. And Oh my God, other people, parents. Ugh. You were spared. I was truly spared because my oldest son was such a hermit. Didn't I mean other kids liked him, but he would shut the door and run from them. He he pr- truly preferred the company of adults usually, mm-hmm. and so uh, it w- he didn't like you know he get overstimulated. He didn't like loud noise mm-hmm. and things like that. So um, he just was a. Like we grew up together. He was, you know, to this day, I'm just like, oh my God, you're like the chillest roommate I could ever have. Like he cleans the, the dishes, takes care of everything. He goes, every meal that I feed Teddy, he goes behind and cleans his high chair. Oh. He's just a great big brother, but he's also happy when he leaves. <laughs> <laughs> If you're a longtime listener, you might know I've been using AG1 for a few years now. I started drinking AG1 in the morning before starting my day because I wanted better gut health and more energy, and I wanted to know that I was doing it right first thing in the morning. When I started drinking AG1, it did more than just taste good. It made a real difference in my daily focus. That's because AG1 is a foundational nutrition supplement that supports your body's universal needs like gut optimization, stress management, and immune support. Since 2010, AG1 has led the future of foundational nutrition, continuously refining their formula to create a smarter, better way to elevate your baseline health. 
Not only did I replace my multi with AG1, but I love that every scoop has prebiotics, probiotics, and digestive enzymes for gut support and vitamin C and zinc to help support immune health. Very important this time of year. AG1 is the supplement I trust to provide the support my body needs daily. And that's why they've been a partner for so long. If you want to take ownership of your health, it starts with AG1. Try AG1 and get a free one-year supply of vitamin D3K2 and five free AG1 travel packs with your first purchase. Go to drinkag1.com slash breakdown. That's drinkag1.com slash breakdown. Check it out. Mind Be Alex Breakdown is supported by Helix Sleep. I've had my Helix for about two years now, and I cannot believe the difference it has made and how well I've been sleeping. Jonathan also has a Helix. He loves it. My kids love their Helix mattresses. The Helix lineup is awesome. It offers 20 unique mattresses, including the award-winning Lux Collection, the newly released Helix Elite Collection, a mattress designed for big and tall sleepers, and even one just for kids. Take the Helix Sleep Quiz and find your perfect mattress in under two minutes and Your personalized mattress is shipped straight to your door, free of charge. Helix offers a 100-night trial, which is terrific, and a 10 to 15-year warranty to try out your new Helix mattress. Everybody's unique. Everybody sleeps differently. Each of Helix's mattress models are designed for specific sleep positions and feel preferences. Models with memory foam layers provide optimal pressure relief if you sleep on your side. Models with a more responsive foam cradle your body for essential support in stomach and back sleeping positions. Plus, enhanced cooling features keep you from overheating at night. Every Helix mattress combines individually wrapped steel coils in the base with premium foam layers on top. It is so cozy. It's the perfect combination of comfort and support, even recommended by multiple leading chiropractors and doctors of sleep medicine as a go-to solution for improving your sleep. I happen to be a midnight because I want something firm. I generally sleep on my side. Jonathan's a twilight person, but we get along just fine with our separate mattresses. Helix is offering 20% off all mattress orders and two free pillows, which are extremely comfortable for our listeners. Go to helixsleep.com slash breakdown. Use the code Helix Partner 20. This is their best offer yet. It won't last long. With Helix, better sleep starts now. How, how is your patience different with uh, going the second time around? I, mean, I know for me, when my son, who is now 15, was uh, born, hearing him cry, like I hadn't been around a lot of babies, mm-hmm. hearing him cry was like, maddening i was like i gotta do something I gotta, and there's you know sometimes nothing to be done mm-hmm. they just want to they just need to cry a little bit but was it different for you the second time yeah i mean and with the autism especially you have to learn a lot of patience and like repeating things repeating commands repeating whatever you know soothing whatever you have to do there's a lot of patience and repetition so i've been well trained in that now and then also having the second son I, it's truly a second thing somewhere i'm like eh, you're fine <laughs> 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 that's just, like um and my ex she would like squish his little blueberries you know every month because i was like oh you're clearly the first time you had a kid i'm like if the blueberry takes him out he's not meant to be here <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's weak <laughs> if his gums can't handle a blueberry <laughs> it's interesting because i you know you hear people talk about when they have their second you know like Oh, the second, like the first child gets like the photo album and, you know, the second one is just like hopefully in the background of some picture somewhere. And if you have a third, like there is no photo album. Um, But I hadn't thought about what it would be like to have them, you know, 20 years apart. But it's true. You you already have kind of a parenting toolbox of like, yeah, even though it was 20 years ago. Yeah, and I mean, and that is a big difference. You know, things change so much in 20 years and, and there seem to be wildly different type of boys. <laughs> um, my oldest is kind of felt like always like a firecracker and my youngest feels like a wave where he's mm-hmm. like, he's chill, but he's always on the move. Mm-hmm. He never stops moving. And so that's very tiring. Now that <laughs> <laughs> And just, again, the resource difference is kind of the opposite where my youngest, you know, there were times where, like, I I would be so embarrassed and ashamed because we only had, like, one pair of shoes for him and Mm. and thing. And and now my youngest, you know, has, like, three pairs of Jordans. So it's, like, (laughs) such a... He dresses like a little rich man. (laughs) (laughs) The one picture that I was looking at, there's a really sweet picture of your older son, holding your younger one, which is also just, it's ridiculously cute, 
But I did notice the Jordans mm -hmm. on the baby. It's yeah. pretty cute. Um, can you talk a little bit about sort of like the differences, as you said, in sort of resources and what your life was like when you became a parent the first time and then what it's like now? Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, it was horrible. <laughs> <laughs> It was not a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> I was 20 and I had no education whatsoever. I went to community college for three weeks. I hadn't started comedy yet. I worked at a grocery outlet, not even a regular grocery <laughs> store. <laughs> Well, gro gros they were like, you get the spoiled stuff. That's what I dealt with. Uh, and then, so it was a very... Stressful time. It was stressful all the time, every day. What Ooh. city were you in? I lived in Salem, Oregon. So it was just, a, and I was lucky for as far as his um, autism diagnosis, because especially at that time, Oregon was on the forefront of like dealing with uh, different therapies. And, mm. uh, so, and I ended up living right across the street from an ABA uh, therapy place. So it was, per I mean, it, you know, some things are just kismet in that way. And, um, but it was certainly, you know, food stamps and WIC and things of that nature. So um, now to be able to, I mean, those are things even when the separation and divorce, I'm still very proud of myself to be able to like, mm. oh, oh, I'm taking care of two households and I'm making sure that everyone is thriving and mm. well taken care of and not just monetarily, but with time and mm. with, um, you know, just getting down on the floor with him and playing with him. Like, I love to do that type of stuff as well. I try to, you know, balance. Now that I know what my schedule is with him, I, usually the days he's with me, I don't really, I mean, I do a podcast like this, mm -hmm. but that's about it. And other than that, I'm just with him all day and hanging out. Sometimes I might take a nap. <laughs> and the nanny will take over for an hour or two. Mm -hmm. uh, but other than that, it's just us playing and hanging out. And it's nice Um I couldn't give that to my first son, especially, mm. and and it was in a positive way, especially, you know, once he was diagnosed, I was like, I need to make money. Mm. I need to figure out a career. He might need to live with me forever. Mm. And so it was a very much like, once I found comedy, I was just out doing it every wow. night, trying to get away from open mics and find paid shows. So, um, in that regard, you know, my son stayed with me in a lot of Motel 6s and <laughs> Super 8s to this day. Sometimes I'll be like, where do you want to go vacation? And he'll be like, let's go to Oregon and stay in a Motel 6. <laughs> and I was just like, Dude, if we ever do that again, <laughs> I've made some terrible choices. <laughs> I'm curious if, you know, your son, having your son was like a motivation that you think you needed. You know, do you think you n would have found something if you hadn't had your son or were you like, I need to search right now and like kind of, you needed that jolt? Oh, yeah, I certainly needed it. Yes, for sure. I wouldn't, that's what, what my son's very spoiled. Uh, he <laughs> gets whatever, video games, whatever he wants. And then and a lot of people are like, and it's like, he truly, this is the definition of he was shooting with me in the gym. He was part, he was the reason I was doing things, but without him, I didn't have a lot of self-esteem for myself and I didn't have a lot of um, motivation and I had low standards. And so living in a crappy apartment, having no type of future, I was like, this is fine for me. But as soon as I had my son, I was like, this isn't fine for him. Mm -hmm. And so that was a high key a motivator for me to figure something out um, and to do it in a like consistent and, and stay focused. I think certainly coming home every night and knowing that he, you know, was the reason I was doing it was, was I mean, and it's still selfish, but I love doing comedy. It's not yeah. like a full altruistic thing. I love it. Uh, but he certainly was the gas that made it so I didn't just like go and do a show and then hang out and do karaoke in Portland, you know, yeah. I did a show and then did another show and then came, went home. You can love it, but it still requires an enormous amount of work. You have to overcome setback. And so like, if you don't have that motivation, you know, maybe you don't go as far as you do. Yeah, I think so. Certainly for me. Absolutely. Um, and now it's just same thing with both my sons. They motivate me to my health, with my, um, comedy with everything to just kind of provide a fun life and to make sure that it's not a temporary situation that I'm able yeah. to, you know, take care of them for, you know, for generations. 
I, that speaking of motivation, um, I was curious when you mentioned, you know, like eating differently and, and things like that. Um, you know, I had my first kid at 29 and, um, my second one, whatever, uh, a couple of years later. But when I see people who are like deep into their forties and early fifties with toddlers, like, I don't think I could do it. Like, I think, yeah, I, I don't, I don't, I don't think I would have the physical strength. I mean, there's the exhaustion level and you're still a young man, but I wonder if that's also part of it is like, you are 20 years later, like now you know, you're the age that you are. Like the body. Is that's not, a young dad in LA. He's exactly. <laughs> no, but I'm thinking like that's you. You still like that child doesn't know. They're yeah. like, I want the dad who can run, play, do mm -hmm. all those things. So that's also like its own kind of motivation. I mean, I started. I know we we share a jujitsu connection. No, oh. um, I started doing jujitsu. It was something that my kids were doing. But I'm so glad that I started because first of all, it gives me something that you know, we kind of like do together, or we track together. Um, but also like, it was something that motivated me to like stay active because their needs don't change just because I'm in my deep forties. Yeah. No. Yeah. That's our, I mean, that was one of the reasons I, it was more like a now or never thing with having mm -hmm. another son. And it's uh, very emotional in ways. And now well, short sighted in some ways where because I was just, just missed having someone whose feet fit in my hands <laughs> and their head was in my elbow. And that lasted like two weeks. He had very long legs. <laughs> so it was not. I was just like, oh, wow. Now I just got to deal with you for the rest <laughs> of my life. And he's the best. I love him. I'm so glad I did it. But it was, certainly wasn't like, oh, I want to do this at 45 or 50. I mean, I got a vasectomy after. So now, oh. I mean, it's done. It's just two kids and I'm out. So Two and uh, done. Two and done. But, you know. And, and the most selfishly and honestly, um, I always still worry about my oldest son. Mm. And I want to. You know, the, a lot of my ways of insulating his life had been through money. And then I realized, oh, at some point I'm going to die. Mm. And hopefully he will still be alive at that point. And I really um, wanted someone who loved him enough to also still be around him who might want mm. to check in on him. And so I and I love to see that now. That's actually one of the biggest joys in my life mm. is to see how much they love each other as brothers already. Mm -hmm. Like how excited Teddy is to watch him and to like see the things that he can do that he can't do, you know, and go like, oh, you know, you see it on his face. It's like, oh, I can't do that yet. But oh, maybe one day I'll be able to jump on a trampoline like you, you know, and it's so cool to see. And and again, how much Malcolm takes care of him is it's just a nice bond that they have already that I'm hopefully going to cultivate for the rest of the because I'm going to need them to stick together. This is an odd question. Um, so feel free to, to tell me that it's odd. Is there something in particular also about having, you know, your older son who's on the spectrum and has a very special kind of tenderness? Is there something unique that you see in that brotherhood that you might not see if your older one wasn't on the spectrum? Well, I just, in general... I noticed a real shift in him hmm. and the fact that he went from, I mean, and he still does have like, you know, stuffed animals on his bed and things like that, but he certainly shifted into this like, oh, I'm 20. I'm the big brother. I look out for you. I tell you, don't do that. I tell you to be careful when he was used to being the one who was told to be careful. Oh. And so, and now he's just very, um, kind and proactive i mean he's always been that way but it, I, I mean it's probably one of my biggest successes is how kind he is to mm -hmm. to everyone and um like he, my mom came to a show in chicago i was doing a couple weeks ago and she was talking with my aunt and she told me a story that i didn't even know about where she said whenever she comes to visit my son and oftentimes i'll be on the road and so my son will let her in and ask her what she wants for lunch <laughs> and bring her like a Postmates menu and then he will order it for her and then bring it to her Sweet. and then clean up the place after her. And I was like, that's such a like, that's what a good man does for his grandmother. Mm -hmm. And I love that he does that naturally. 
It's very sweet. How did you get into jujitsu? I know you're a you're a wrestling fan. Yeah. Like your whole life? Yeah, since I was five. Wow. Yeah. You were raised on like classic WWF. Mm-hmm. WWF, yeah. WCW. Who did, you, who did you like? I mean, everyone okay. at the time. Hulk Hogan, right. Ultimate Warrior, Earthquake, <laughs> uh, Coco Beware, <laughs> Juco Scorpio, wow. uh, Hot Stuff Eddie Gilbert. Did you go to stuff in person or I'm you watched on TV? Yet. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just see how that looks. Go ahead. No, it was just, what were you saying? I was just curious if you went to to venues in person or yeah. if you were a, got it. Yeah, my uncle would take me to shows in um, Chicago. Chicago has always been a hotbed for pro wrestling and, and comedy. So uh, I um, would go to Rosemont Horizon and see WWF house shows when I was younger and I got fell in love with it. Um, how did you discover jiu-jitsu? Uh, Freddie Prince Jr. I mean, I'd heard heard about it before him, um, but he really brought it to my life. Um, I, he did my podcast once, and then we just kind of... He also is a big wrestling fan and I think owns a wrestling league currently. And uh, he talked about how much... Everyone else who I had talked to about jujitsu had always... Um, really stuck with the physical aspects of it and the, the the defense aspects and the aggression aspects. And he was the first person who talked to me about the spiritual aspects of mm. jiu-jitsu and how it made him feel um, the confidence that it gave him, the spirituality that it gave him, the um, just the guidance and just the um, how it helped his... He said that it felt that it helped his acting. Mm. And so... Um, when he, the way, you know, sometimes it's not even what someone says to you, it's how they say it and the love in their voice that you hear about mm-hmm. something. If someone tells you about a dessert that, you know, a waiter, and you can actually hear it like, oh, they've tried this dessert and they really believe in it. <laughs> and it was just the way he spoke about jujitsu and his professor in general that I was just like, okay. And then once I got, was getting divorced, I was like, okay, there's going to, I've been divorced before. So I know some of the steps. I know there will be a lot lot of anger and I was like I should probably put that in a positive way I know I would want to choke someone I should probably get someone who will volunteer uh, and so we put those together and so in January I started going and, and, and been enjoying it ever since I love it go two three days a week really My Beyond's Breakdown is supported by BetterHelp. Many of our families or communities participate in the thoughtful tradition of gift giving around the holiday season, mine included, although we do try and focus also on simply enjoying the holiday time, eating together, laughing, visiting together, maybe with the occasional gift thrown in. Whether or not your family gives gifts during the holidays, you get to define how you give a gift to yourself. And the holidays are a great time to do just that. Whether by starting therapy, going easier on yourself during the tough moments, or treating yourself to a day of complete rest, remember to give yourself some love this holiday season. Whether or not your family gives gifts during the holidays, you get to define how to give to yourself. I'm a huge proponent of therapy all year round, but especially during the holidays. It is a critical part of how I keep things going during the holidays without losing my mind. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. Maybe do it today. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Fill out a brief questionnaire. They'll match you with a licensed therapist. You can switch at any time for no additional charge. In the season of giving, give yourself what you need with BetterHelp. Visit betterhelp.com slash break today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash break. My Beyond's Breakdown is supported by Squarespace. Squarespace is the all-in-one platform for building your brand and growing your business online. Stand out with a beautiful website, engage with your audience, sell anything, your products, content you create, even your time. Squarespace makes it so easy for creators and educators to monetize their content and expertise in a way that fits their brand. There's member areas where you can unlock a new revenue stream for your business and free up time in your schedule by selling access to gated content like classes, online courses, or newsletters. Stand out in any inbox with Squarespace email campaigns, collect email subscribers, and convert them into loyal customers. You start with an email template, customize it by applying your brand ingredients like site colors and logo. Built-in analytics measure the impact of every send. Support your cause by gathering contributions with PayPal, Apple Pay, Stripe, and Venmo. Gain powerful insights into who's visiting your site and how they're interacting with your 
content with in-depth website analytics tools, including page views, traffic sources, time on site, most read content, audience geography, and so much more. Squarespace also has powerful blogging tools to share stories, photos, videos, and updates. Categorize, share, and schedule your posts so that your content is working for you. Display posts from your social profiles on your website. Automatically push website content to your favorite social media channels so that your followers can share it too. Go to squarespace.com slash breakdown for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, use the offer code breakdown to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. So we were going to ask you what your spiritual uh, impact or how has jujitsu impacted you spiritually? Um, in a lot of ways. I mean, I guess the most simple ways is with co- putting real self-confidence, the feeling that I can um, have a connection with my body and myself and, and full focus. That's Ooh. what I really enjoy about it. I feel like every time I do it, it it's like a bap- I get baptized because I'm so sweaty. I'm laying on the ground. I'm smiling. I really have to slow my brain down and mm-hmm. focus, but also stay active physically. And, you know, and I'm starting now to just now get some of the very basic lessons of like not thinking while I'm doing, mm-hmm. but just following my instincts. And um, a lot of it is also going against your base instincts of like pulling away from someone or you know making a a rash decision and to be able to like kind of slow down and see beyond your like low level and primal reactions to like what is actual like is a higher decision making is very spiritual to me and i enjoy it a lot and just some of the lessons with my divorce and i mean he was just teaching me an escape if you i tell this when anyone asks is uh, he was teaching me this escape, and he was like, there's two options. He's like, one, you turn away from me, mm. or the other one, you have to turn into me, and you might get your face mushed, you might get some rug burn, but you should be able to get away. And I, and it was just so profound to me of like, that's a, you know, a lot of choices in life, is that sometimes the only option is to go through a uncomfortable situation where you get your face mushed and you get your cheeks burned, but you get out of it. And uh, the only other option is to just submit. Mm. And then you've lost. So mm. there's just, you know, there's been lots of lessons, but it's only been eight months. So I'm imagining I'm going to get some more. I mean, that's a pretty powerful analogy right there for most of life. You know, my jujitsu experience was, you know, I was usually one of the only females. So mm-hmm. it's very different because one of the things I really loved about jujitsu is, and I, I think this is also a bit of a spiritual principle, is learning to leverage what you have. Mm-hmm even if it doesn't seem like it's the strongest in the room or the biggest or the, um, you know, you don't always feel the bravest sometimes just based on what you're kind of coming to the table with. But the notion of learning more about your body, learning about leverage, learning about positioning and often escaping um, is also really helpful. And I think of that as kind of a spiritual principle. I agree with you. And I I said, if I had a daughter, I would feel like I would, I mean, I wouldn't force them, but I would certainly try to introduce them to it. Because just the um, base level of like, a lot of it being thigh base, being hip escapes, being um, how do you, what do you want do if someone's on top of you and you don't want them to be? I think that's mm-hmm. a lessons that um, should be instilled in you know every well, most women that need them, unfortunately. But I certainly, if I had a daughter, I think it would was still a lot of self confidence. I'm, I mean, I'm gonna put my sons in, or especially when I took my oldest. He tried once. He said he doesn't want to go back. <laughs> but I'm gonna put my youngest. Hopefully, he's gonna like it and get into it. And let me just know what you said. It was one of the first places that really told me to like, oh, use your use your weight, use your leverage. You mm. you know, smush me. Like you know, right. that's going to be what you have that's helpful for you. Um, and because sometimes. You know, going on my health journey and stuff, a lot of times my weight has been always used as a way to put me down or mm. to make me feel bad. And one of the first things he said to me was like, make your weight my problem. Mm. And I was like, oh, my God, that's such a better way to look and better way to feel about it. Like, this is I am who I am. And you'd have to deal with whatever I bring. Mm-hmm. I like that a lot. Use what you have for your mm-hmm. to your advantage. Yeah. I, there's a lot of talk about jujitsu amongst comedians you know yeah. probably because of rogan i think we should start a league <laughs> and just fight each other me and you russell peters can fight yeah everybody you have to fight while also making them laugh yeah <laughs> but what do you think there's what's the parallel between comedy and jujitsu or is there one 
Well, I don't know if it is just comedy, although I knew a lot of comedians that do it. I feel, and it might just be where we go because it's an affluent <laughs> class, uh, but the amount of like successful people I see in jujitsu, the mm. amount of people who, no matter what their industry is, they really are good at it, they have success at it, and they're looking for mastery of it beyond just like money, beyond things. They're looking to really get into the details of their craft. And I think a lot of that with the comedians who do it, with the actors, whatever, is a lot of these people who really love problem solving, really love figuring something out, really love putting forth an effort and sweating and failing because that's how we got to where we are. That's how I got to where I am is by failing so many times, so many bombed auditions, uh, auditions, so many bad sets and having something where I start at the bottom of and have this white belt and I know I'm probably have it for years and I'm just gonna go and get better and I feel my progress I see my progress um I think in turn it has helped my comedy where I'm able to look at the details a little bit more I'm more confident in my abilities I'm more confident just in general of just like okay if you hate this joke what are you gonna do you probably don't know jujitsu come <laughs> over come on over <laughs> If you do know jujitsu, don't because I've just started. <laughs> <laughs> I think also jujitsu is a very creative um, mm. kind of you know fighting yeah. form. Very improv. Yeah, like with taekwondo or with you know some of the the other you know Eastern martial arts. There's, there's more fixed. Format. There's there's forms and yeah. there's a lot of formality and you know we bow and there's like a way that you bow like. Someone got called out by our um, our instructor um, because their eyes were focused in the wrong place while bowing. Mm. Like it's that, you know, specific. And what I remember, you know, from jujitsu is kind of like whatever works is also the rule, which is also true in comedy. I mean, it's mm. true as an artist. Um, jujitsu really is about like read the room, you know, mm -hmm. re read the body in front of you every time it's going to be different. Something that works with one person on any given day may not work with someone who you think is going to have the same, you know, style or whatever. Um, so I think when I when I think of jujitsu, like there's so much creativity to it. Um, and that makes sense to me, too. And I think the lack of structure, I would imagine, you know, really appeals to, to people who are used to being kind of creative like that. Yeah. And just like I love it when you I mean, the cre creation. When you think of something and you go, okay, I'm going to try to do this. And then it works. It gets mm. so exciting. And when you're able to not just think of it, but able to physically execute it at the speed that I need so that my professor doesn't just turn me around and flip me over. <laughs> um, it makes me, especially when I know, you know, because there's certain times when I know he's like, all right, well, you've gotten me here. I'll let you get it. But there's times where I'm like, okay, he doesn't want me to catch him yet. And when mm. I do, it makes me so happy. I'm I'm curious if you can talk a little bit about what this um, strike period has been like for you. Sure. Um, you know, everybody, depending on our our version of employment or, you know, art form has been impacted differently. And, um, you know, for a lot of people who write, you can still write during the strike. It's just there's not a lot we can do with it. Um, so I'm kind of curious, you know, you also, you know, have this baby. And um, so that's also probably been a, a period of... Mm -hmm you know, getting to know him at this age in in, in a different way. But yeah, I kind of wonder if you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm probably in a very rare situation where I was like stressed out about it, but I also was like, oh, this is actually great timing for me <laughs> because I, um, you know, got separated last winter, about October, and um, had to go start working on the show that I work on. I guess I can say them now. Lou on Apple TV. I couldn't say that before. That's fun mm -hmm. to say again. Um, check it out. <laughs> um, and so that started back up in January. And so... Right before it started up, I went to Amsterdam and Paris for like a little trip to just kind of clear my head and hang out with friends and smoke a lot of weed. And then and go to the Louvre on Mushrooms, which I highly recommend. <laughs> a wonderful experience. Um, and But certainly nowhere near healed at that point, and so, but had to go to work. And I thought it would be a uh, escape and would be like, okay, I can't focus on anything else. But what I found was that, oh... 
I have all the emotion from this mixed with the emotion of working 14 hour days mm. on a set. And so I, and I think, think I handle it very well. I don't think I yelled at a single person or no one would have thought I was a bad person to work with. Um, but I, certainly felt it every day mm -hmm. I would leave and I would just be drained and I would be completely worn out and tired and just sad. And so to kind of suddenly have this break to be like, okay, mm -hmm. Well, now you can have time to go to jujitsu more. You have time to see your therapist more. You have time to um, go back. I mean, a lot of my life this year has been like returning to the roots of things that made me happy and got to me where I am. Mm -hmm. So to just be, have to go back on tour and do stand up and see mm -hmm. some of the people who knew me when I started, like in shows in Portland, and to have people who knew me from like one year in, two year, wow. years in and come and see my show and have them be like, oh, this is like the most authentic version of you that I've ever seen. This mm. is, and that's what I've been really working on. So it's been a nice, in that regard, I've mostly just been filling for other people, for the people who I worked with on Loot, the PAs mm. and everyone who, um, the makeup people, the, the hair people who, you know, Truly, because, you know, whenever you go on those sets, you hear about, like, oh, I got this coming up and then this and then this, because mm. that's what they need in order to make ends meet. They have to have three or four things that's lined right. up. And so just being stressed out about that for them and, and also realizing it's helped me realize a few things where I'm like, oh, I don't think I want to tour as heavily as I used to. You know, I had my new son. I've really noticed, you know, now that I'm 40, how bad it is for my health, mm. how hard it is for me to maintain my diet and my exercise and how those things are kind of more important to me now mm. than like doing 20 sets all over the country. You know, I'd rather I can do shows in LA. I can do, I mean, I'm always going to want to perform. Mm -hmm. and, and that's it again. Like just getting back to the basics of like, oh, I don't necessarily need to sell out a bunch of theaters. I just love doing comedy. Mm. So if I can do that while also hosting some show that keeps me home and near my son, that would make me very happy because I want to, do a lot of the things like I said that I could didn't do with my first son I want to if he th gets in a sport I want to be a coach I want to be a, a I I want to go on the museum trips and, mm. and hate them you know I want to do it because it, hey it'll give me a bunch of material that'd be great and it'll be um a way because I especially having the two kids like I'm really aware now of how quickly it goes and how mm. Like one day you have this baby and the next day you're watching them put on a graduation cap. Mm. And I want to be as in the moment with my new son as I can be because he seems to be a special little boy from already. He just mm. seems like a sweet guy. And so I want to continue to mold that for him. I, I have a question about, you kind of mentioned um, a bit of the momentum that happens, I think especially in comedy, mm -hmm. where, you know, once you have, some level of success and you sort of like book stuff, there's this like momentum of, okay, now we book more and we book more and there's a tour and there's a thing and it's like more, more, more. Um, and it's something we were talking with Fluffy um, about that in particular about, um, you know, there's a certain kind of like emotional burnout, I think in particular for comedians, because it's such a, it's such a raw and vulnerable, like you're up there kind of sharing so much of yourself um, but I, I think about it, not just for people in our industry, because obviously I, I experience it as an actor. Um, there's like momentum. It's like, oh, well, you did this show. And so now you're going to do this and now you're going to do this. And now we're going to book you for this. So I wonder if you can speak a little bit about sort of what that's like to to take control of it a little bit mm -hmm. and say, I'm not just going to keep going on that momentum, but like, what do I actually want? What makes me happy? Yeah, I mean, I think it comes as part of the whole trying to have mastery over my craft. It's just not only on stage, but also realizing what I wanted from comedy, which at every time I, was, I just wanted to be able to pay my bills, take care of my family and have a good life. 
And in order to do that, I have to have a nice work-life balance. I have to go on vacations. I got to have fun. I got to go to concerts. I got to see live live performance because it refills my cup. It inspires me when I go see other people perform and see them happy and in their element. I saw uh, Maya Rudolph, who I work with every freaking day on the show, and I see how talented she is but i saw her do her prince cover band princess and it was like a whole nother thing and i was just like oh my god this is like i can see how happy you are i can see how in your element how much she controlled that room how sexy she was and it was was all these things where i just like that is so beautiful to like you do this because you want to because this is what makes you happy and then in turn, it has filled an entire room and it's mm. sold out. And so I I am not there yet, but that's the path that I want to be on. That's where I want to head towards. And a lot of, um, you know, there's a time where you were so used to being told no that when people mm. start saying yes, you don't know when to turn them away. You don't know when to turn, you know, when someone offers, if it was an offer, I'm like, sure, we'll do it. And then it led to me having some bad times and some bad experiences. Mm. I'm a big believer in mantras and, and different things. And there was this one time I just made a mantra where I was just like, you know what I really want is less work, more money. <laughs> and that's easy to say and fun to say. But it's terrifying in reality mm. sometimes to turn down something and just go, I feel like something better is going to happen. But it has for me. It served me well. And the, and the little bit of, is scary. And But whenever I do it, it turns, if I don't feel it, if I don't feel like it's going to be fun for me. And I've had some great um, mentors. I've had great people around me. And my acting coach from day one, she was just like, there's like, Five or six reasons why you take a job. Money. Do you need that money? If you need it, take that job. Is it going to be a good experience for you? Is it going to be an experience where it's going to bring you around people? Maybe it's not going to give you the money. Maybe it's not going to be that fun. But is it going to bring you around great people? Is it going to bring you around the people that you want to be around? You know, and if it, if those the things are true, then take the job. But if they're not true, don't take the job. And that was difficult for me sometimes, but it didn't. And I've seen so many of my friends who are more successful than me, and I'm, and like they never take a vacation, and they never um, seem that happy. <laughs> they seem very frustrated, and I was just like, I don't ever want. Like, when do you win? You know, when do you realize that you have a beautiful life and you have fun? And so I rather, you know make a little less money and go to Japan for a couple of weeks or just do what I need to, to have a fun and beautiful life because that's what I'm here for. I'm not here to, um, you know, produce content for other people. I'm here to have a fun life. It almost seems like there's like two phases to self-esteem in that, you know, especially for those of us who live off of other people's applause or approval or like, that's how we know we're successful, right? Mm -hmm. Is when someone hires you for the thing that, you do that makes them happy or rich or whatever it is. It almost seems like that's the first hit that your self-esteem gets like, oh, I have something of value to mm -hmm. you or you <laughs> will exploit me so that you can mm -hmm. get wealthy. And in the process, I will be more well known or I'll make money. So that's like the first phase of this like self-esteem shift. But then it seems like the second and more kind of mature aspect that you're talking about is then being able to say, I don't just live for you. Mm -hmm. That self-esteem means like I have esteem for myself in that there's a place where I now get to say, is this making me happy or mm -hmm. is it making me happy in this way still? Yeah. I mean, the pandemic was certainly, I think, the thing that shifted me from that because it stripped away everything I had to find myself for previously, where I was just like, I'm a comedian. I'm a comedian. This is what I do. I'm before I'm a dad, but I'm all, I'm a comedian, Ron Funches. And then when <laughs> I couldn't do stand up for like a year, mm. it really, you know, it was devastating. But out of that devastation came this thing of like, oh, what really am I? Mm. Like, who am I for real? And I'm like, oh, I'm a, I'm a great dad. I'm a great son. I'm a good friend. I'm like all these other things, and that to me started to really feel solid as opposed to judging myself based off of 
my last set or mm. if I someone wants to give me a special or if you know because it never because it's always a shift in goalposts right. the things that I wanted so much when I first started you get them and then it still is just like okay well I'm on a show but why don't I have my own show you know and it's just like these things are ridiculous when you say them out loud but they really affect you mentally and I mean one of the greatest things I had was sometime I, I think I don't know where we were but we were in the same building somewhere together I don't even knew if we knew each other at the time but I heard you like you were pitching something or working on something and it was just after um, uh, Big Bang had mm -hmm. ended and you were talking about how frustrating it was because the whoever whoever you were talking to wasn't receptive mm -hmm. and I really opened my eyes at that time I was like oh and she was going to blossom and then she just comes off of this and she still they still won't fucking just bet on her <laughs> like and I was just like oh okay it's not personal it happens <laughs> to everyone you know and I still I forget that sometimes but it is it's been a helpful reminder huh I wonder how much that actually also frees you up to do the comedy that you want to do if you're not like, oh, I just need that next special. And I won't name names, but there's been in the last, you know, six months, some comedians that have released comedy specials and I listen to them or, or watch them. And I'm like, this feels like you just needed another hour. <laughs> <laughs> and your sounds al almost like a parody of themselves versus like really being able to say something new or you know they didn't feel like they were in their own skin yeah i i understand that and i agree with that i will um just the stand-up comedian me give some excuses and just be like you know not everyone is an actor not everyone um wants to be an actor and so sometimes these specials are the best way that they can mm. make money in mm. order to continue to tour and so it's not necessarily about them being ready or wanting or feeling like they need to make an hour they, you know, sometimes they're contractually obligated to deliver a special mm. every so often um for me Luckily, no one's bringing down my door for that all the time. So I get to do what I prefer, which is to like kind of create and let my life change. And most of my comedy is personal. So um, the more I live, the more I go through things, the, the deeper I'm able to make the connections in my stand up. And. Uh, you know, and I've been lucky. I'm lucky I didn't put out a special. If I put out a special a year ago, it would have been how much I love my wife. <laughs> <laughs> the hour. <laughs> so I've had to restart a couple of times with material and adjust and change. And I just, again, I always try to go back to the childhood version of me and what I loved and what I enjoyed. And I never cared if, like, my favorite artist put out. I liked wanting to something to come out, waiting, being like, oh, when are they going to do it? My favorite artist of all time is Outkast. And I, I love that every album that they put out, so sonically different, such mm. a change, such an evolution in their lives that you can tell. You could, you knew where they were in their lives with each album from their debut, where there's these, these young, hungry people mm. talking about looking up at ceiling fans, and you can see the pencil marks and the things that they're writing in the dungeon, and to them, to the hey ya of like, my life is a Super Bowl pop festival, you know, and to have so much evolution and change. It was like they didn't operate off of a yearly schedule or two year schedule. It was about when when the new album was better than the last one. And that's mm -hmm. kind of how I judge my the way I create an hour is like, when do I feel this is better than the last thing that I put out? Um, and currently I'm getting real close. So I'm hoping I'm going to tape something soon. That's awesome. That's awesome. Um, I want to, I want to, before we let you go, I want to visit a different um, aspect of <laughs> Ron when he was sure. little. Your mom was a social worker mm -hmm. and um, my parents were public school teachers, which sometimes felt like they were therapists and parents to, you know, all the kids that, you know, that they um, spent most of their day with, you know. I had parents who had to deal with other people's children, you know, all day and then come home and deal with us. Um, and I'm curious, did you understand what your mom did? You don't sound like you have any issues with that. <laughs> Just a few. <laughs> um, no, but I'm curious if you knew what your mom did. I mean, you know, social workers are often a bridge, you know, mm -hmm. in so many situations when there's not 
you know, mental health access of a certain type. So, you know, to me, when I meet people who know social workers or who are social workers, it's such a precious, precious, mm -hmm. in, in many cases, thankless, you know, kind of task. And I wonder, um, where where did your mom work? Like, where was she a social worker? And what do you remember of that? Uh, she worked for Salvation Army wow. for many years. And what I remember mostly... Um, and I didn't know at the time, but now it's just kind of interesting to like have someone who spent their all their days helping other people, trying to help them connect resources, trying mm -hmm. to get them out of bad situations, help their children, you know, have better food and better things. And and while we were literally probably one rung above that, mm -hmm. like my you know my mom was a single mom, she was the only one bringing money in. My dad wasn't necessarily supporting the family at that time, mm -hmm. and so we were not doing well. It wasn't like she was like, well, now my life's good and I'm going to be a social <laughs> worker. Like she was going into the projects, going to Cabrini Green, going to places. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, just kind of, and sometimes she would take me and, and she would just be like, you know, if you don't, <laughs> this is where you can end up. Mm -hmm. If you don't, you know, take your schooling properly, if you don't, you know. And that's one thing that I love about my mom is that she was always, extremely hardworking, extremely active with us and showed us other things, took us to museums, took us to um, musical performances mm -hmm. and just showed us art and showed us that the world was bigger than where we were. And it's just, she's always been a helper. You know, she went from being a social worker to being a nurse. And um, she worked with a, as a private nurse for a while with a bunch of like rich older people and she didn't like it. And she started working as a nurse in a prison and loved it. Wow. And, you know, just being able to help people and uh, giving care to some people who, who a lot of people had turned their backs on. And so uh, she... Love, she said they're you know she hated her co-workers and loved the prison and, so, <laughs> <laughs> and my mom's just a helper and now you know she's got four grandbabies she lives with my sister and mm -hmm. splits time over here and and just real friends grandkids and whenever my friends have a trouble like my friend's dog died and she was like can we call he, he was like can we call your mom <laughs> <laughs> My mom is just like the best advice giver, the best supporter, because she's been through so much and she's seen mm. so much. And it's always such great advice. And, you know, she was one of the uh, when I made the decision to get divorced and get separated. Um, she was one, you know, I was really surprised. because I felt like, you know some judgment I got some of my cousins being like you guys should try to figure it out but like, you don't you've never been to our house if you've been here you might not say that uh have you seen the the, the, the chemistry over here you might not say that um but my mom was just like she's like I, especially you know I have the little baby and everything so I was really worried about what she said and the first words out of her mouth was that she was proud of me mm. she's like I under she's like I can't imagine how tough of the, this decision mm. this is for you knowing that you're not going to see your son every day knowing that your life's going to change knowing that you you know you might lose some money you know knowing all these things and you're still making the tough right decision mm. for you and she's like I'm proud of you and that's just kind of like the person my mom's always been she's been a big supporter supported my comedy from the beginning and then fell off two years in because she <laughs> but then she came back around <laughs> <laughs> um one final question you know i always imagine for people who grew up with parents who were like therapists or social workers that it's like having a built-in therapist is that what it felt like or you you mentioned you've been to therapy. Was mm -hmm. there a point in your life where you're like, I need help that's besides my mom's wisdom? Yeah, oh, for sure. Yeah, when you realize you're making me, again, I've been divorced twice. <laughs> and so you can't blame that on other people wholly. You got to look at your own patterns and cycles mm -hmm. that you have. And um, and that's what I'm focusing on this year. I'm trying to stay single mm -hmm. for a whole year because I'm a serial monogamous. I jump into other relationships and put my energy into those people instead of focusing on myself mm. and now I'm grilling salmon and grilling shrimp for myself I wouldn't have done that before I would have thought that was too difficult turned out <laughs> pretty easy and so I'm really focusing on myself and, and and being able to be a great dad and great just happy and have a good mental mind state so um 
therapy has been a big part of that mm-hmm. for sure. I'm, I'm a therapist, Donna, who I love very much. We're seeing each other a m- monthly, which makes me feel great because I'm like, if it was more than that, I feel like I really got some issues that she was like, I need to see you every single week or every day. But the fact that she's like, once a month is fine. She's like, all right, we got some obstacles, but in general, doing mm-hmm. good. I'm told that you have mood board parties. Yeah. Is this a thing? Yeah. Can you explain what a mood board is for people who don't know? And can we get an invite? Because that sounds awesome. You want to (laughs) come? Yeah. It was my little vision board party that we do. Um, It was basically um, a New Year's tradition for me um, because I don't drink. I'm allergic to alcohol. And I just realized I've been spending a lot of New Year's Eve just chasing women around. Ended up on party buses that I didn't want (laughs) to be on. And I was like, this does not seem pretty. Productive. And that's I how I met my <laughs> on a party bus. <laughs> so you're gonna unmeet me too. Yeah, that thing, that sounds like a place you hang out. Uh, <laughs> um, and I'd heard about vision boards and just decided to have a party one day in my apartment and just was kind of skeptical but still into it and we did it and I put that I wanted to get a house for my oldest son on that time because we lived in the uh, Is it bedroom. pictures? It's words. Yeah. Oh, okay, let me explain like, it. Go, go from scratch. Sure. It's just like a business plan but for your life. <laughs> you know, you wouldn't just come into a bank asking for a loan with no business plan. And you got can't go into your life for the year with no guidance, no goals, no map. Mm-hmm. So it's just like whatever you want on there. Uh, spiritual goals, physical goals, just materialistic goals. Like my my bidet in my Japanese toilet, my to, my Toto Neo rest. It was uh, on my vision board years ago. And are you using magazines? The internet? Yeah. Magazines. Just like a bunch of magazines. A bunch and of magazines. Scissors. Sometimes the internet, sure. And scissors and yeah. glue. Yeah, and we do it is very crafty. How big is this vision board? Um, I mean, like poster size, but you could it really like free the form. science fair in eighth grade, like that. Pretty much. <laughs> a lot of it's like that because we present them at the end. Do you also bedazzle them? Yes. There's stuff to make them decorative. And yeah, fun. if you want to, you know, like words of affirmation or mm. just pictures that make you feel powerful pom-poms? and strong. Sure. I like a pom pom. Yes. And then you share them with one another. Yeah. Is there any like discussion, notes? Like, how does it work? No one gives you notes because they're not allowed to give you notes on your goals and dreams. But we. <laughs> Says you. <laughs> yeah, sure. Okay. You're really <laughs> pressing on this invite. <laughs> You're going to come in and change the vibe. <laughs> She's like, set the bar higher. <laughs> well, we don't give prizes for the best vision board. I can't win anything. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, but we discussed it. A lot of times it's led uh, to people kind of like collaborating with each other when they realize that they had similar goals or could help each other in different ways. That's nice. Um, yeah, so the last one was in my house. We had like 30, 40 people. We, I would have to be very intoxicated. You can be. I would be terrified. No, this sounds amazing. Ter- I'm already crying thinking about it. Sounds nope. very Bad supportive. <laughs> Yeah, people cry. We order a lot of healthy food and, um, you know, healthy-ish. We still have party. And then people do get inebriated and then they share their dreams and then they, you know, go home. No, I mean, I would need to be inebriated just to be in that social situation with all that you'd vulnerability. Be, you'd be fine. No. You'd love it. You People would be crying. You would love a good okay. cry. Well, what a great way See? to bring this in the me, new year. I changed my mind. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, I don't want her at my party. No, you I, go and you tell me how it is. I, I will. <laughs> yeah, I feel like you, you people would love you there. <laughs> I'm into this. I got to build my vision board. I got to start getting That's... magazines because I don't have magazines. <laughs> all our magazines just have words. It's just I know. Harper's. Just all your Harper's <laughs> magazines. Just a lot of cartoons. <laughs> it's just words and some weird abstract poems. Ron, you mentioned kismet way earlier in this episode. Do you feel like a divine intervention in your life? Because, you know, I make up that you're quite spiritual and setting intention and it sounds like you're practicing mantras and you have the spiritual relationship with jujitsu and you know I have a lot of questions about how you got your comedy presence because um we've spoken to a, a lot of comedians it turns out on this podcast and they're great storytellers obviously but um there's something about them becoming themselves on stage you know what what I love about your comedy is like you're so 
I was really excited to meet you in person because your comedy presence is so unique. You know, I was watching a bunch of your um, Instagram videos uh, yesterday and just to like remind myself about um, some of your stuff. And like, you feel so calm on stage. You know, you have such a presence. Um, and so I wanted to see, is that just you? <laughs> <laughs> And from the, you know, being able to sit with you here, like it, it does feel like a lot like you, but I would imagine it takes a lot to get that, mm -hmm. to come to that and to be able to, you know, be that, especially on stage all the time. Like, yeah. how did you do that? You know, maybe not a simple answer. And then I guess the second part is like, do you feel some sort of divine intervention that got you there or, or still guides you now? Um, I mean, I guess that's the one I can answer easier, which is, yeah, I mean, I'm just a big believer in most things. I believe in more things than not, and because I think it's just more fun. Um, and just like I prefer things sautéed than fried, because it's more fun to say. Um, so <laughs> that's how I like to live my life. And I've just felt that way. Um just through different things in my life, through the timing and things in my life where I certainly feel that there is a guidance sometimes from whether it's, you know, ancestors or whatever you want to call it. It's hard to put words on it, but I just believe in multiple planes and that we happen to believe live on this current physical plane. And But when we pass on, we maybe we move on to another one. And that seems fun. Why not? Um and as far as being myself on stage, it's just, I mean, it's a true journey. It's a, a ever active, it's like staying balanced on a ball, you know? Like it seems chill, but it's a lot of core work. <laughs> it's a lot of like focus and a lot of like going through things in my life. Like, just moving around a bunch, having my son at an early age, having my son have special needs. There's a lot of things that happen in my life that really folk forced me to really dive into individuality. You know, having a son who had autism was like, okay, he's going to be different. Our lives are going to be different. The way that he needs to be parented is going to be different. And I'm going to have to defend all of that. Mm -hmm. And so I need to be able to defend myself, my individualities, who I am as a person, and continue to push that. And getting some success in seeing that the way that it changed me a little bit, seeing, the ways, seeing some ways to change my friends, where it's like, okay, wow, you used to be super fun and chill and I could make fun <laughs> about your thing, but now if I make fun about the project that you're on, you're mad because you're, if it gets canceled, you think you're never going to work again. I don't live like that. I think that, you know, things get canceled. I I'm always kind of like feeling like this. Where I'm like, yeah, okay, I worked on this because I was new and then I'm doing this. Yeah, that probably, it probably sucked. Sure, but I was learning and no one else was going to give me an opportunity to learn, so I did it. And just being able to kind of dig back into like what I love in comedy and that it's not, I mean, Conan O'Brien gave me one of the greatest um, compliments I've ever received. And I always think about it and guides me all the time is that I was on a show um, doing a couch and we were just joking around and I said something and improvised and made him really laugh. And then, you know, we go to commercial and he just leans over to me and he goes, you know what I like about you? He said, you like comedy just for comedy. Mm -hmm. You don't like it because of what it's going to give you. I can tell you just love comedy. Mm -hmm. And that's always stuck with me. And I was like, man, I love that he could see that in me because it is true. Um, and I'd never want to lose that. And in order to do that, I have to just be myself, be free, be happy. And even the divorce was a lot of that of just like, okay, I thought I had something that I really wanted and was fully in love with. And when I started to feel um, it not feeling right for me and not feeling like it was going to help my because everything's tied together if my life is if anything is screwed in my life my comedy goes that way as well so i was like oh if there's an issue here it's going to affect everything i do so i need as hard as it is i have to continue to dig deeper into myself and that's where i feel like i gain most of my knowledge is internally it's just through time through things unlocking it's a lot of times where there's certain things where i'm like oh i didn't know that but there's a lot of things where i go huh Somehow I think I knew that, and now I, I've unlocked it. Mm. But I didn't know that. It's you a didn't know weird. You knew. Yeah, I didn't know I knew, but I knew that. Hmm. And that's the interesting. Um, I don't know how to explain that, but I hope that answers your question. It sounds. What I make up is you sound integrated. 
you know, to say that everything is connected and that, oh, some people will be like, oh, the marriage isn't okay, but I can escape into comedy. Mm -hmm. But for you to be like, oh, that isn't working and it's mm -hmm. going to have spillover effect, it sounds like you're just integrated. And mm -hmm. in that integration, you bring yourself uh, to the stage and to being present. And I think a lot of people can uh, listen to that and learn from it and relate to it no matter what they do for a living. Yeah. Well, yeah, I agree with you and that. It's just that the biggest thing that I, I mean, the earliest lesson I took in, because I could just go to open mic and I'd see these people and some of them wrote these jokes that were just so great. And I, could, I was like, wow, I couldn't write a joke like that. Some of them be so like wild and on stage and so like charismatic. And I'm like, oh, I don't, I'm not, I'm a little more introverted than that. Um, and some of them had washboard abs and I was like, well, yeah. I don't have that. And, and so it's a point where I was like, oh, I can't chase or beat certain people at things like the best weapon i have is me mm. and so the more me i become the more i dig into what i am and what i love and what i'm about the more i differentiate myself and i think it served me well now and just that um you know i don't get a ton of auditions but when i do a lot of them are meant for me a lot mm. of them are written in mm. my voice a lot of time you know i've had a lot of breakdowns that come run funches type and i take that as it you know a huge compliment even though i'm continuing to change so you know who knows what that even means it's been such a such a pleasure to get to talk to you in more depth thank you for letting us pick your brain um i highly recommend that people go see you can you um can you tell us where you're going to be um, on November and December. I don't remember. Uh, you can you tell me? Thank you. Let's pull it in. Oh yeah, let's just keep it here. Um, that's very helpful. You're gonna be in Vegas. I will be in Las Vegas. Oh, please come. I swear to God, it's gonna be a horrible time. Um, <laughs> probably for me, not for you. I will do great. I will work real hard. But I'm imagining it's gonna be ha oh half full is probably optimistic. <laughs> so if you could come by there's a lot of entertainment choices but if you're in to the introspective stylings <laughs> of a single father while you're in las vegas <laughs> please come by wise guys november 3rd and 4th um if you're in la please i do this show with my friend blair saki called uh, fun voices we have a bunch of friends it's a secret lineup uh, it's 10 30 november 18th at the uh comedy store in the belly room other than that i'll be in san diego at the american comedy Club. right around thanksgiving yeah yeah i think now that got moved to week after december 8th and 9th <laughs> uh, so um and then other than that i'm just hanging around los angeles because i'm trying not to tour as much because it's bad for, I'm trying to get my health together. Tell people about the podcast. Oh, it's called Getting Better with Ron Funches. It's um, a comedic self-help podcast and just like personal journey of whatever I'm going through. Um, we have guests on occasion um, and people who I love and enjoy and want to find out how they got to where they are and how they're continuing to get better. And then a lot of times it's just me talking about my life for the last couple of weeks and what I'm doing to get better because it's hard to book a podcast sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> and then they come by and then they're like, I didn't like what I said. Let's not do that. And I was like, I'm a, you, this is very, <laughs> this is limited time that I have. <laughs> well, it's been so much fun having you. Um, we wish you all the best and uh, hope to see you uh, at a gig. Yeah. I would love to see you on stage. Oh, um, I love that. Live and in person. It's a pleasure. I always enjoy talking with you. It's been fun meeting you. Wow. What a great combo platter. That's what we say from our <laughs> breakdown to the one we hope you never have. We'll see you next time. It's my and Bialik's breakdown. She's going to break it down for you. She's got a neuroscience PhD or two. One fiction, one and now she's going to break down. 